at to where, to where we are right now. And so I, I think, for example, here, um, some of the early, uh, this is a, a fossil. It's one of the old, world's oldest fossils, which is um, a colony of bacteria. This, this kind of fossils are usually called, uh, are called stromatolites. So which is, it's a colony of bacteria. And this is about, um, this is about um, sort of over three, uh, three bi uh, billion years old. Uh, just yeah, 3.7 billion years old. Uh, this was found in, the, in Greenland. And of course, there have been others found. For example, there was one which was also found in uh, Australia, which was about uh, three point, about almost 3.5 uh, billion year old, billion years old. So um, as we know from the theory of evolution, um, life started in water. And then, um, of course, the animals sort of, um, you, you start getting land animals later. But that transition from, um, from uh, animals in the water to land animals, um, it was in part due to so, so, so some of the evolution that had happened uh, inside the uh, water. So you, you get, for example, here is uh, what is called a tetrapod. Uh, these tetrapods where when you look at the vertebrates uh, you have the vertebrates uh, the fishes and then you, you start getting uh, this fish with, uh, with which had four legs <laughs> uh, uh, this this way this was the transition to sort of um, the uh, land vertebrates and um, so in the past um, it was thought that um, because most of the vertebrates uh, had been found you know you know in, in the Devonian, they were in the Devonian era. And um, uh, at the time, the continents looked very different. And so the, the area, the region, which was uh, around the equator is where they had been found. So it was at that time, it was thought that um, these, um, these tetrapods had only been um, able to survive uh, or probably the conditions favorable for their survival were around the equator. But, um, so uh, later on, um, I think about two years ago, one of the South African uh, uh, paleontologists uh, called Rob Guess, he then found some fossils uh, which were in a place in Grahamstown in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. And this was quite uh, extraordinary because um, it also showed, because this region uh, was in the Antarctic uh, circle during the Devonian period. So it also showed that, well, probably um, the tetrapods were not only found in the equatorial regions, but could probably have been in other regions as well. So um, in a way, you could say this is how the science progresses. You find where we, we have limited fossils and from the limited fossils, depending on the location where they are found and whatever information is available, you draw up a conclusion. But as new information comes up, you kind of revise the story, um, as it were, the science. Um, so uh, moving on, um, I think later in time, you start getting the human ancestors and um, Africa has been termed the cradle of mankind uh, because a lot of these, um, uh, most of the early hominid ancestors or early human ancestors have been found on the African continent. For example, here you have um, uh, Sahelanthropus chadensis, which is about 7 million years old. And this was found in Chad. I think it's the oldest. And you have quite a number of them also have that have been found in the uh, in East Africa, countries like Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, and Uganda, and Tanzania. And there are a number that have been found also in South Africa, such as the Australopithecus sediba and um, uh, Australopithecus prometheus, which uh, is also nicknamed uh, Little Foot. And um, I think the short story is to say that all these um, different specimens have actually contributed to the story that we have today or the science picture that we have of what life on earth was like uh, in the past. 
Of course, um, they have also led to some very interesting sort of information you have here. This this is uh, just a picture of cover of science or the where Sediba when Sediba was 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 first announced. Uh, so they have actually led to some very interesting and a lot of science and a lot of scientific debate. Um, so uh, how uh, how does it work? Well, generally to find the fossils, uh, the scientists uh, have to go out into the field and find uh, and look for the fossils somehow and, and pick them up. Um, so here, for example, these are owner students uh, there is usually an honors field trip um, for paleontology at the University of the Witwatersrand Rand every year. Uh, and the students go out and they're taught how to, how to look for fossils. Uh, but so you don't just go anyway <laughs> also. There are um, sort of uh, areas where you are more likely to find the fossils. And it also depends on what the people are looking for. So for Let me example, ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. So the one you were mentioning, the A. Sediba, um, which had so much um, press reports on it, uh -huh. it was found actually by the teenage son of the person, wasn't it? Teenage son of the professor. Yes, actually. yes, of, of Lee Beggar's son, yeah. Right, okay, that's really interesting that it was found by a teenager. Yes. Okay, yes. go ahead. I thought I'd just mention that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But the father gets credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> he's the professor. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I think what, what, what is important here is that, um, so you, you have the different sort of, um, there, there are different stratigraphic layers which, um, which have been dated by geologists. And so you know that in a certain stratigraphic layer, um, uh, this this layer, let's say you, you you know this layer is seventy million years old. This one is one hundred fifty million years old, or something like that. And so, they are the kind of fossils that you expect to find. So, depending on your research questions and what you're looking for, you then go and look in 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 an area where you know that this is where probably the the date that you would be looking at the sort of range of dates that you'd be looking at. Um, so sometimes you find the fossils um, like on the ground, as you can see here, the people are not really digging, they're just looking on the ground and seeing if, if they can find something. In other places, you actually find the fossils um, in caves. Um, sometimes you find them in water, it's just different conditions where you, you of course, you find them. Um, so uh, when you find these fossils, uh, generally, they, this is what they look like. Um, you don't always get a, a nice looking specimen, as it were, and it takes, um, I would say it takes, takes a keen eye to actually identify one. Uh, you will find that when you, if you look at the fossils that have just, uh, when people go to the field and they bring back fossils, you look at them, uh, some of them you can actually see that this would be a stone that you'd have probably thrown away. Uh, but um, yeah, once you've been trained, you can actually figure out whether it is a fossil and you can sort of immediately tell whether it is a skull, it is a limb bone, or yeah, what, what, what part of the anatomy it could be. Um, and by the way- I, um, I, Excuse me, can, can I ask a question? Yes. So what you're sp speaking now, this store, so you're going looking for fossils of, of human? Uh, ah, or, okay. Or you just general go and, because where, where, I, where I live, um, I, I live uh, in, in Israel around the middle uh, Mediterranean, so I get to find a lot of fossils, but it's it's sea creatures. Yeah. But what you're describing, you're going to look for human fossils. Ah, uh, not necessarily human fossils. So, so for example, I mean, in, in this region here, these guys were not looking for human fossils because uh, we we know it it is known that you you probably don't generally find them here. There is a region in, in South Africa called the Cradle of Mankind where, where a lot of them have been found. And um, it has got caves and um, so people then hypothesize what it might have looked like before and why probably you have a lot of human ancestors. But uh, what I'm saying is, um, so you have the different stratigraphic layers and if, if, of course, if you are looking at, if you go to a place where you know that generally from geology, this 
place is dated, let's say 70 million years ago, then you know there was nothing human uh, at that time. And so you can't be looking for anything like a human ancestor. Well, the, effectively they're all human ancestors in a certain way, but yeah, yeah you understand what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was talking about uh, the fossil here, which, which this guy is holding in his hand. Uh, but by the way, uh, I put in the lo the lamp logo here because this is uh, Gideon, and he's currently joined us at the ESRF for a two month stint. Um, uh, he's on a fast um, um, on a fast uh, award where he will be learning to use a synchrotron for tomography. So he was also part of the field trip uh, of, with the people that I showed. So uh, once you've been to the field, then um, you, you bring back, um, it's, it's effectively their rocks with fossils embedded uh, for the most part. Sometimes you find well-preserved rocks without too much, uh, well-preserved fossils without too much uh, breccia or rock around them. But over the millions of years, of course, there has been a lot of um, sediment going around and, and it has also become rock. And so you get then to prepare the fossil and you use the micro jack hammer and usually also with a, with a microscope, it's a very mechanical process and you try to remove what is not the fossil and leave out what is. And, and so for example, here you have um, this uh, nicely prepared uh, fossil here, which has been extracted from the breccia. And, um, the unfortunate thing about this process here of uh, extracting the fossil, uh, the mechanical preparation is that, well, I mean, uh, there is a lot of human error involved. So sometimes you're going to break the specimen. Sometimes you're going to remove something, um, a, a piece of the anatomy uh, that, is, um, that is very important. And in other cases, you're also going to, you're also going to uh, sort of modify something and, and, and people might draw the wrong conclusions. And so this is why, and, and also um, from working in the Evolutionary Studies Institute, what, what tends to happen is when, when you go out on a field trip, there are several field trips in a year, different groups go on many different field trips and you end up getting something like maybe um, 500 or something like that, new fossils that, are, that come in uh, at the end of the year. And some of them are pretty big. Some of them are quite small. And everyone who wants to work on his fossil wants, uh, wants them to be prepared. Uh, and unless you have 50 people preparing the fossils where the resources are not available, then it takes too long uh, to prepare one uh, specimen. And it, sometimes a preparator can take more than a year. And so this process is not very efficient. And so this is where tomography comes into play. So, I, I am not going to spend too much time uh, talking about tomography because um, I think Gianluca and Andrea gave a, a very good talk on Thursday last, last week, um, which I was also listening to. So um, I think the short story of tomography is that, well, you then take your specimen, you get have an, your X-ray source. This could be at a synchrotron and it could also be at um, an lab source. Uh, so in this case, you have a cone beam uh, because you have a, a point source of X-rays and uh, the X-rays are emitted in the shape of a cone. Your specimen is rotated around um, and you um, collect projections and you then do some reconstruction and you get a 3D image of your specimen. Okay, so this is, I think in short, what would happen. Of course, you don't always have a cone beam geometry. You might have a parallel beam. Uh, at most synchrotrons, um, but effectively the technique is this is sort of the schematic of the of the of the experiment that you'd need to do. So once you have collected the data, then then comes um, um, a, a lot of work that you need to do, which sometimes can be very manual. So uh, after collecting the data, uh, you then want to extract the fossil. Uh, from the from the rock because you when you when you did the tomography um, you scanned the rock uh, with the fossil uh, they're both rock by this time <laughs> um, but uh, because uh, and depending on how long the the fossil has been in the ground 
uh, sometimes the contrast between the rock, uh, the, the breacher and the rock itself is not, very, is not that great. And so if, if this is the case, then what you find is that you, you get um, um, the pixels that make up the, the fossil and the pixels that make up the, the sediment around it are very close to each other in value. And so you have to manually segment. And this is what you then do here in, in this lab. Uh, you typically then open your data and you go sometimes slice by slice, picking out the pixels that make up the fossil and leaving out the pixels that do not make up the fossil until you have something that looks like what we see here on this screen. So for this kind of procedure, you generally want a very powerful, uh, well, not in terms of processing for the most part, um, but uh, you use certain softwares and you want, um, because the data are usually quite big, so you want a, a lot of RAM on, on your computer, um, especially like in some cases you'd need something like a terabyte of RAM and th that makes the computers quite expensive. And it also helps uh, because it's a tedious process, it also helps if you have a tablet to do this uh, with, a, with a pen uh, so that you can um, do this more easily. Okay, so once you have, uh, so the process of extracting the fossil um, that you do in several softwares. Uh, there's VG Studio Max, there's Aviso and Dragonfly and ImageJ, or there are others that people use as well. Uh, but um, I've tended to use mainly uh, VG Studio and I've just started using Dragonfly. Uh, I've also used a bit of Ami uh, Aviso and uh, the, uh, VG Studio and Aviso, they are quite expensive. Um, and so most it's they're not easy to buy and so you want to buy the software and then buy the computer with the lots of ram on it uh whereas the dragonfly if you if you if it's for academic purposes you get this for free and this is actually quite good and image a is completely free uh which one can just download on any computer okay so uh having said so once once the tomography has been done then you are now have the virtual data. So for example, here, these are um, some of the hand bones uh, are from Homo naledi. Um, some of you might, ha might have heard of it. It's, um, it's one of the sort of latest uh, dis uh, discoveries by Professor Lee Beger in South Africa. Uh, it's a human ancestor. It's about, about 500,000 years old, uh, somewhere there. And um, so, once you have the virtual data, then you can now study the virtual data. You can look at several things. Um, and of course, with tomography, it allows you to see inside. And um, it also, the idea is that um, for, for, for precious fossils like this, well, they're precious because we only, usually you only get a few of them or one of them and you don't want to break it. So this allows us to preserve for future use and also so that people can study in the future. Okay, so um, for example, um, one good example is the petrosal bone um, uh, for one of the specimens. This was sort of an isolated one. Uh, with this kind of thing, you could actually, when you've, when you've done the tomography, you can then have a look at the, at the inner ear. And from looking in the inner ear, you, can, uh, you, sh you, you should be able to then determine whether the the specific specimen used to walk upright or which which way because then it tells you about uh, information gives you information about the balance uh, you could also do uh, the acoustics to try to figure out um, what frequencies uh, probably this um, uh, these individuals were able to 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 hear of, um, and and yeah uh, I, I would say that there are quite a number of studies that people can do uh, from 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 the information that they get from tomography okay so uh, as i was saying there's um i i uh, there is in south africa there has been um a lot of quite a number of discoveries so one of them is uh, this one called the little foot uh, it's called little foot because um when it was found um i think as uh, sekazi was just mentioning uh before uh, that for sediba it was uh, Lee Beggar's son who found the fossil, whereas for this one, it was one of the technicians who worked with, um, uh, with, uh, um, sorry, I'm, uh, 
with with Ron Clark, Ronald Clark. Um, so it was one of the technicians. He they they found they had they were sort of um, looking at this site and they had found a lot of bones. And when they were looking through the bones, it was there was a mixture of um, uh, of bovids and all this kind of thing. And then he just picked one and he said, "This I think is um, is, is is a hominid." And, and it looks like it's, a, it's from a hominid and it must have a small foot. Uh, can you show me where you found this? And so they went back into the cave and, they, and then said, let's look in this area. And they looked for it and they found uh, this whole specimen is, 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 the, most, <laughs> is the most complete um, uh, human um, uh, hominid uh, available in the world. Um, and um, it's, it's got an exceptional degree of preservation. And it's, it, I think they, they calculated the geological age um, and it was found to be around 3.67 million years old. And so of course, I mean, it makes um, some invaluable contribution on understanding early hominin evolution and paleobiology. And um, so with this information, one can actually find um, sort of, information about extinct primate ta taxonomy and diversity and phylogenic relationships. And one can also try to derive locomotor behavior um, as I will sort of show in a little bit more detail um, in a few more slides. Okay, um, so this was the paper, one of the papers that came out of that work um, uh, on Littlefoot. And of course, there was also another one on the Atlas um, um, of, of, of Littlefoot. Uh, Actually, there were quite a number of them, and some are still coming out at the moment. Okay, so uh, having said this, I think uh, what I'm going to now do is give a sort of a brief overview of one of the sort of um, topics that I've been uh, involved in. Uh, uh, sort of, this is actually ongoing research that I'm uh, I'm part of. So. Um, The idea here is that um, we're, we're in the in the place where I was talking about the cradle of mankind, uh, where there are a number of caves and sites where a number of fossils uh, in South Africa have been found. Um, you find that, um, for for example, with the Sediba, you only have the two uh, uh, two sort of specimens. Um, for little food, you have only the one, and. So you don't always find a lot of, you don't have 100 um, uh, Australopithecus sediba uh, specimens, you only have the one. And so you want to do research on it and to try and figure out what was the environment like, what, what, um, and, and a lot of other information. And this is not, this is not easy. So um, because of this, one would like to reconstruct the environment in which it lived. Uh, so at the cradle of mankind, you have these old world monkeys, which are called secopithecoids, which were lived at the same time and existed at the same time as, as some of these um, some of these findings. And one could then sort of try to find environmental signatures in these um, in these um, old world monkeys to then decipher what the environment looked like and probably then also sort of correlate with what you have found. In, in these fossils. Okay, so using these old world monkeys, the idea was that, well, maybe we could actually reconstruct um, the, their locomotor behavior and their locomotor behavior should then be able to tell us um, what the environment was. So the locomotor behavior would be, well, did they walk upright? Did they climb in trees more often? Did what, what, what exactly, how exactly were they existing? So to do this, we, we then, um, what we did was we, we looked at the trabecular bone. So, um, so the trabecular bone, which you find in, in, in the long bones, uh, you'll find that actually um, um, they, um, they, they, so it's, it's this mesh-like bone or cancellous bone that you find here, um, uh, for example, in this region here. And uh, of course, if you look at it closely, this is one is sort of a virtual representation of, of the trabecular bone. And the trabecular bone tends to get oriented in certain directions, depending on the loading uh, of, uh, uh, on the loading mechanism. So uh, 
for example, a, a young child who, who has never walked uh, at all, uh, the trabecular bone pattern would look different from the trabecular bone uh, pattern of someone, a, a much older person, and, um, and also from someone who runs a lot or someone who, who carries a lot of weight or something like that. Um, and someone, a person who climbs more often. Uh, so so th this, these are the signatures that we're looking for from the trabecular bone. And there've been several studies that have already been done to show that you can actually get these locomotor uh, signals in the trabecular bone. And so the, the parameters that we'd be looking for are sort of um, the anisotropy of the trabecular bone, uh, the density, which is the bone volume to total volume, uh, trabecular bone spacing and trabecular bone um, uh, thickness. Um, so what you then do to obtain this um, uh, information is you then do the tomography uh, initially. So for this kind of work, um, you don't necessarily need to go to a synchrotron for this, um, uh, but it also depends on the resolution that you require and also, I mean, what kind of um, material you have. But for the most part, at least for most of the specimens that I've seen, you could actually do this um, in a lab-based system. So you, you do the CT scanning, um, and usually you want to do it at, at, at the best resolution possible. But of course, you are sometimes limited by the size of your specimen and a, num um, and a number of things. So once you've done this, uh, the, um, what if, once you've done the tomography and then you select a certain volume uh, inside the, the bone uh, uh, of, the, of the trabecular bone. And from that, after virtually extracting this in, in one of the softwares, uh, for example, we did this, um, we uh, extracted the volume of interest in Aviso, and then you do the quantification um, in, in bone J or image J. Uh, bone J is just um, a plugin of, uh, on, on, on image J. So the issue here is that when you're, when you're extracting the volumes, you need to sort of make sure that you're extracting it. You need sort of a systematic way to extract it um, sort of the same place all the time. So that, so that when you're now doing the comparison, then you, you have um, something that is comparable because uh, it would make a difference, for example, if you extract one trabecular bone volume here and you extract the, uh, the other trabecular bone volume over there uh, and so on. And so you also make sure that you're extracting the same size. Um, there are several things that uh, make this not so simple. So for example, here, <laughs> uh, you, you, can, uh, you have, as I've said, you always have a limited number of, um, of fossils. Um, I remember um, uh, one of my professors at, the, at this university uh, used to say that out of a million individuals, you, pro um, you probably get only one uh, getting fossilized. Uh, and um, and of those that are, pro, uh, are are fossilized, then the chance of finding one where we, we, we actually go and find that one which was uh, fossilized and well preserved somewhere is also very low. But uh, in any case, here you have the fossils that we some of the fossils that we um, uh, we, we we looked at in our study, and what you find is that. Well, some of them, uh, and as much as they look excellent from outside, they look well preserved. Uh, there is infill over time. Uh, some something as uh, there was sediment getting into the into the bone, and the trabecular bone um, disappeared, and now there is nothing to see. <laughs> and whereas, well, for some of them, actually very good, uh, like they're well preserved, and you can take your measurements and extract them. Um, the, the, the volumes, but also the, the problem with the infill is that, well, uh, suppose you want to extract now because for, for here, for example, let's say you choose this for a volume around this, this region here, um, which would make sense, for example, when you're looking at this specimen, but you look at the, at the next specimen and there is infill on this side and it's only, there's nothing here on the other side. So this is what makes it um, slightly more difficult. So one is to, you try to look for as many um, specimens as you can. So the good thing though uh, with, um, with, uh, with old world monkeys is you can find relatively more of them compared to the hominid specimens. And so, uh, but then you, you don't only do that, then you also find extant material like modern day um, material so that you, you then compare with what you have from, from the old world monkeys. Um, 
And so we, we also, uh, fortunately at this university, at, at the medical campus, they also have quite a, a lot of these. So we managed to actually do a lot of tomography on these as well and extract um, the material. And you can see, I mean, for, for this, this is like pretty straightforward and you get like very, very good results. And from the results that we obtained, uh, one then finds that, well, you know, uh, in, for, for sort of the preliminary data, uh, as I say, this is on, uh, the study is ongoing. Uh, we, we, we initially did something like seven fossils and three extant uh, femoral heads were analyzed. Uh, the reason why we ended up with seven is not because we started with seven, but we found quite a lot of them were head infill. And then for some of them, you know, you want, as I said, you're looking for to extract the trabecular bone in the same regions. Um, and so we, we then did the morphometrics analysis. And from what we found, uh, the results so far, <laughs> they indicate that the trabecular bone structures and the femoral heads, um, we, we, well, the, the signals that we're getting is that they are more terrestrial than arboreal, which, which seems to indicate that um, it, it was an open savanna environment um, uh, where it was where, of course, you have a sort of, um, sparse, uh, there, 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 is, there, there is a lot of, is there more grasslands with um, sort of trees, but not, not too dense. Usually you don't have these dense uh, trees that are densely populated. And because of this, then um, uh, the, probably the old wood monkeys then used to sort of walk long distances, but also climb trees, but not, uh, but not they were not climbing all the time. Um, okay, so of course, as we have said, we are now doing a more comprehensive study. We have found a lot more specimens and the tomography has already been done. And at this point, uh, we are actually doing the analysis. And, um, and so of course, uh, quite soon, we hope to get the paper out. Um, okay, so that's, that's one kind of uh, sort of uh, research that we have done. Um, at the Evolutionary Studies Institute, we, which we are actually undertaking. Uh, now, uh, just to move, move some, uh, something that is more specific to, um, to synchrotron uh, tomography, uh, it's uh, phase contrast imaging. I, I think uh, Gianluca and Andrea also talked about phase contrast imaging, where, of course, because of the variations in phase, in the phases of the X-rays, when they pass through the different materials, that make up your, your, your specimen, you get this phase contrast. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and generally at the ESRF, we, we tend to use um, propagation-based uh, phase contrast where you just vary the distance between the, um, the specimen and, uh, and, the, and your detector. Uh, you could also use gratings, of course, um, to achieve uh, phase contrast imaging. And there are other new techniques, for example, like um, like tachography, which are sort of related to uh, tomography, which could be explored for use in 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 in, in, in paleontology uh, for paleontological applications. So um, the good thing about phase contrast, you get much better contrast, which makes it easier to segment, uh, uh, and also you get better sensitivity to sample inhomogeneities. So I think a, a good example, uh, just to show what we're talking about, uh, there are also fossils uh, uh, of ember. So these uh, rocks uh, of ember, uh, you, you, they okay when you, um, when, when, uh, when, uh, so, so the, the, some of the fluids that seep out of trees, for example, and then over, over, over time they solidify, and you could have an insect which, well, which got trapped in the fluid. And over the over over time, then the when 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 the, this fluid uh, then fossilizes, then you you get um, the, the 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 insect that was inside is trapped in there, and it they tend to be well preserved, as well, uh, in most cases. Now, if you put this in in, in an X-ray beam. Uh, you you don't see anything as you can see this is this is there is like using absorption contrast um, 
I, I think this was also explained because um, so with absorption contrast, you are relying on the densities of the materials. So you want if if your two if if two materials that make up the different components of what whatever is in your sample have very different uh, densities, then you 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 get you get a lot of contrast because um, the one uh, material is going to absorb um, X-rays um, more, much more than the other, and so you'd probably get a histogram with two peaks which are separated by um, by sort of one could say a, a, a sort of a larger distance. Uh, so that would be your absorption contrast, which is dependent on on the density and sort of um, on what is called the uh, uh, attenuation coefficient, but um, see the thing is with with absorption contrast when you now have something like this then you don't see anything but with um the same radiograph using propagation uh, based face contrast uh it's the exact same radiograph that we're looking at but now you actually see a lot of detail you can actually see the insects two insects here uh you can see the abdomen the thorax you can actually make out the limbs of this um of these insects and you can make out actually several more structures that are inside this particular specimen, like these bubbles and, and whatever else is there. And this makes it easier to then um, uh, sort of uh, extract the information that you need to study these particular insects. So for example, uh, this here is um, after, after you've done the, um, uh, segmentation um, and sort of processing the 3D volume. You've, uh, this is what we have inside. Uh, sorry, <laughs> this is what we have inside the inside the, the that um, uh, ember fossil, where you actually see that you have several uh, different types of insects that are inside, and well, something else that was in there, and quite a number of things that may be a little bit difficult to identify. Okay, so this is like a very big advantage of using uh, synchrotrons. Uh, why it is easier to do phase contrast um, um, imaging at synchrotrons is because uh, you you generally uh, in the hatches the you have long propagation distances so it requires coherence and when you have long propagation distance you get a more coherent beam and uh, not only that also the distance um, in order for you to actually get the phase contrast between the uh, between the the sample and the detector, you can vary it. Uh, we typically have sort of slightly larger distances in there. Okay, so uh, then moving on. Um, so some of the um, some of the research that has been done at the synchrotron in paleontology uh, using uh, phase contrast is, for example, uh, in teeth. So for for for, for I mean. So this 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 here was the first experiment uh, or publication uh, on a South African hominid. Uh, it was the first demonstration of um, of dental histology. So um, this technique was to actually demonstrate the accuracy of of this uh, um, of, of of the technique. So what would have happened before? Uh, this point here was that um, if someone wanted to look, so in teeth, um, the, you have these growth layers. So you can actually tell how old an individual was at death by looking at the at the at the at, at these uh, uh, growth layers. And um, if you to in order to look to have a look at this, what you'd have had to do is you'd have to had to cut the tooth and look at it uh, at hist uh, to cut histological sections of the tooth and and have a look at them, uh, maybe under a microscope or something, and take pictures. But um, so this here was um, you uh, uh, what Paul Tafaro uh, and his colleague did is that they took a, a tooth and did uh, face contrast tomography on the tooth and you can actually see uh, the, the, the sort of the growth lines here and they took the same uh, same section uh, a histological section uh, and so and uh, and so actually the tooth was uh, they, they did the tomography first and then cut a histological section out of it and then they found the slice which matched exactly where where they were in the uh, in the uh, in, in, in the histological section, and as you can see here, this is like um, this is um, 
the tomography is very, very accurate. You can actually see all the lines and it, like everything is well represented, I could say. And um, so, so here, um, I think you then have a, a comparison of the real slice and, and the virtual slice. And if you, the, the cutting was done with a uh, diamond saw, uh, and then they used a, mic, a microscope of about um, 30 microns with uh, the one on top. And then uh, the one below, uh, the, it was uh, done before histology. So with the uh, tomography. Now, um, just to, to see, just to show that actually this is a very accurate method. Um, here they have superposed the um, histological sections onto the onto the onto the uh, onto the sort of uh, uh, tomography slice, and you can actually see that this is this is this matches exactly what you get. And so uh, I think. From this time, I think there has been a quite a lot of experiments similar to this, and um, this has now become sort of um, the go-to technique, uh, where instead of doing histological sections, tomography actually helps us to study the materials and without actually um, having to cut the materials um, in any case. And, and, and at a synchrotron, we can actually do this at quite very high resolutions. For example, at our beam line, you would be able to do this at something like 0.35 microns. Of course, if, if you went to a nano CT uh, beam line, you probably you might be able to get even much better resolution. Okay, and um, now uh, I think uh, I'll sort of move on uh, a little bit to sort of um, uh, the Moshops capensis. So this, uh, the Moshops capensis, uh, it belongs to, um, um, this uh, it belongs to um, an animal family called the Dinocephalia. Uh, the name translates to terrible head or something like a uh, terribly large head. So this, uh, they had very large head. And um, this was done sort of, um, <laughs> the tomography was done um, um, on, on this uh, specimen sort of twice. So it was, when it was found, it, it was already broken. And so it had two sections. So the first section was brought. Uh, so when South Africa, when in South Africa, you, you can imagine um, in a country, you have these fossils and they're very rare. And now someone, one of the researchers wants to take them out and go to a synchrotron facility somewhere so that they can get them tomograph. Um, everyone is skeptical because this is national heritage. And so the, this was sort of the first trial in South Africa where they went to a synchrotron to try and do this. So the first one, they brought this, um, this skull. And um, it was uh, the, after doing the tomography, they looked at uh, how this, um, this Moshops uh, capensis or this dinocephalian, you uh, replaced the teeth because you could actually see uh, how uh, some of the teeth, um, uh, that, that the non-erupted teeth uh, inside, the, inside the, the mandibles of this. Uh, so then about 10 years later, um, let me see, the video is not playing. Let's see. Ah, yeah. So about 10 years later, the other half was brought and then uh, the, that's when uh, the animation was made. So the Moshops capensis, it had a body weight reaching up to about one or two tons and it had a brain the size of a chicken egg. Uh, so the brain was probably one of the smallest among its contemporaneous uh, specimens. And uh, their anatomy, it shows that the male moshops were ramming into each other like giant overweight uh, 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 goats, um, which would probably maybe explain why they evolved to have, end up having such uh, big sort of uh, skulls. And yeah, so this here is sort of a rendering. And uh, as you can see, here you see some of the sort of, you can see some of the uh, sort of the fossil here and some of the, um, so yeah, uh, so this is just a video going through the material. And of course the two parts are sort of slightly different um, in, um, in parameters because well, the two scans, the, 
were done in so over 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 ten over a ten year difference in time. Okay, so uh, then um, so also in South Africa, they were so dinosaur embryos. Um, they are they are they are very rare, and of course, um, but they but they are also uh, very useful because uh, they provide a unique window um, into the paleobiology of the animals. You can study a lot of questions, sort of as to how did how did these animals sort of uh, ossify and um, uh, the ossification, uh, and you would need a non-destructive technique. So, uh, some time ago in South Africa, there there was a, uh, in the Golden Gate. Um, a national park they were building a road and they found these fossils and they called paleontologists and um, they picked them up and they found that they were actually uh, dinosaur embryos um, so some of them were taken to canada where they were prepared uh, because um, because they were actually quite good at preparing with acid and uh, so you can see here one of the embryos where you have actually has been where the embryo has been exposed and you can see a, a small dinosaur inside um, and of course um, um, it was found from this uh, the, then the tomography was they were brought to the ESRF for tomography and um, you could then sort of reconstruct the sort of anatomy or the skulls and uh, and, and of the embryos. And you, it was found that these are what were called the mesospondylus uh, dinosaur. Uh, the mesospondylus is quite uh, common in South Africa. And uh, we, there is actually the type a specimen, which is, um, is also in South Africa for this uh, mesospondylus. There is uh, sort of, we, we, you have the adult um, uh, mesospondylus um, dinosaurs also. Uh, uh, well-preserved ones that have been found in South Africa. So um, the one after doing the tomography, then you can then sort of uh, take measurements and do the statistics. And uh, you can also place landmarks and do um, um, sort of uh, morphometric analysis, uh, which um, I think I'm not going to explain here. But uh, so, but what I'm going to just explain is that, well, I think the findings of this study, uh, which was done um, by, uh, led by uh, Dr. Kimi Chappelle, um, is, is that they observed a now generation teeth, uh, which, get, um, which, which get resolved or shed before hatching. And they, their study also show, allowed them to come up with a method to assess um, the developmental stage of extinct in, in, in um, uh, in, in, in vivo or, or, or saurians. So uh, uh, of course, uh, with the data that is now available, uh, people can then uh, go ahead and, and uh, sort of look into sort of um, a bit more sort of um, uh, different ways to study and come up with new research questions. And so this, this was the paper from uh, Kimi Chappelle and colleagues. Um, uh, then, um, Next, there was also a uh, heterodontosaurus. Um, so, so as I was explaining, when people go out into the field, you don't necessarily find uh, a fossil looking like this already prepared. So here they, they, they went to the field and they found uh, sort of um, these bones here. And so they marked them and uh, when, when it was time to extract them, it was not easy to extract them because you couldn't actually dig out a, unless you wanted to spend the whole year there. <laughs> so they extracted the sort of, they cut out the stone tablets as it were <laughs> with the fossil inside. And um, for this kind of study, they, um, they and then they were prepared uh, with the preparators at the Ev Evolutionary Studies Institute. And they did a very good job as we can see here, you can actually see the skull, you can see the limb bones, you can see some of the ribs and quite a lot of the anatomy. and. Uh, with this specimen, it looked like pretty straightforward that if you take it into a lab CT, uh, you would actually get very good results and, um, and, and there would be no need to do much more. You can then study, uh, uh, do the paleontology. But um, I, I, when this was brought, I was still working at the Evolutionary Studies Institute at the time. And I, I'm the one who actually did the tomography on this particular 
um, specimen here. And this, they, unfortunately, it had a lot of um, metallic inclusions. And uh, I think due to the geometry also of the, of the, um, uh, of the tablets and the, uh, in addition to the contrast differences, it was particularly tough to get very good data for this particular specimen. So again, um, they were brought to the ESRF for tomography. Um, and this is sort of um, an artist's impression of what it might have looked like, <laughs> the heterodontosaurus. So it was found in a riverbed and then prepared, um, yeah, uh, but we can only do so much with preparation. But um, after the tomography, um, do I have the video here? Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't play. Okay. So once the tomography was done, then you you do then again the segmentation, and you 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 can then extract um, uh, you can extract your 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 specimen virtually. And so this is this is what it looked like. Where uh, now you can actually see everything in three D. Uh, you have your your ribs here, your limb bones, and you can actually see um, like the different um, sort of components. And you can sort of turn them around. And not only that, you can also look inside. And so this gives you. I mean, if you also want to study the trabecular bone here, you can actually go for it. You you can look at the different, so there are quite a number of things that you could then look at after this. Um, but what was interesting here is that, uh, what was found here is that actually, uh, there are these, um, these features here, um, which I say they look like sort of tennis rackets <laughs> in a way, uh, but they were found, um, this, this was new and it was not known to have existed in this particular, um, as, uh, in, in the heter heterodontosaurus before. So you have the ribs, you have everything else, but, but here you didn't, uh, you actually didn't. Uh, so, uh, so this was, um, so the, the, actually the reconstruction um, showed actually how they breathed and um, it was, um, which, which was uh, quite phenomenal. And um, so yeah, that, that was, this was the paper that came out of, uh, of that study of the heterodontosaurus and um, I am, I think I'm almost getting to the end. So um, the last fossil that I'm going to show is the fossil barrow. I, I think for me, this is one of, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, so this was picked up in the, in the, I think it was in the sixties or seventies. Um, I, I, might, I might be a little bit wrong about the date, but at the time the, uh, we didn't have a, a CT scanner uh, for, for research in South Africa at all. And so um, you can imagine, I think at the moment there are over something like 10,000 uh, fossils in, in the collections at, at this university alone. So this, this is a fossil burrow. And what tends to happen is when, um, when you have a burrowing animal, it digs a hole uh, in, the, in, in, in the ground and, and they live there. But sometimes uh, it will die whilst it is in there. Uh, or maybe it doesn't die, but there is infill. Um, maybe there's a flood and um, it's filled with, 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 with mud. And over the millions of years, it, it, so, uh, it, it becomes a fossil. And the rock around it uh, also becomes rock. Uh, the, 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 the sediment around it becomes rock. And so you end up with a rock that looks, that has got a shape, which looks like a barrel. And this is why it's called, uh, they're called barrows. And whenever paleontologists are in the field, when they find a barrow, they, they tend to, of course, you kind of check if there's something in there. So this was picked up uh, because it, well, it looked like a barrow, but not only that, there was a little bit of a skull here that was exposed at the time. Uh, but then because um, there was no, I mean, it was just put in the collections and, um, uh, and it stayed there for a while. And later on, in around 2011, 2012, uh, a CT scanner was bought for, in, for research purposes. And it was put in the CT scanner, but uh, because it's pretty dense uh, and slightly on the big side, you get, you, get, you get some reasonably okay data, but then it's not great. Uh, so after that preliminary data that was ob uh, obtained, um, this was grounds for actually applying to the ESRF for um, uh, a, a, um, for synchrotron uh, CT. And so this was done at, uh, at the ESRF. And after this, you actually find this is what you get. So this is um, 
a cross section of the fossil barrel. And you can actually see uh, sort of the, uh, the, here is the fossil um, lying around here and you get the pressure around it or the rock around it. Now, uh, after segmentation uh, of this fossil, what was, this was pretty amazing because what was actually found is you don't actually have just the one animal in there because this is the animal where, so the one way we could see the skull at the beginning uh, without even any CT scan is this one here, this guy here. So this is the skull that we could see, but we actually have an additional uh, animal that was inside the barrel, which is this one here, uh, which is called a trinoxidone. Um, uh, what was interesting here is that these are two very completely different animals. This one, uh, the, the Brumistega, uh, was, um, it was an amphibian. And then the, this, this one is a trinoxidon and it was a mammal-like reptile. And these animals existed about, you could say about 260, 250 million years ago. And so one could say, actually, this could probably be our ancestor, this mammal like reptile in any case. So of course, um, one could then try to speculate on why these two animals were, were sort of sharing a home. Why were they in the same uh, barrel? And um, of course, People, I mean, the, the, one of the sort of go-to uh, conclusions could be that, well, maybe one was trying to eat the other, but on examining the bones uh, that you have here, you find that actually there are no signs of, um, of, of, of a predator or one eating the other. Uh, what, what is apparent though, is that um, this, this one, uh, the trinoxidone, it is known it was a burrowing animal. So this was probably its home. And then this guy, uh, the, the, the Brumistega, it it has uh, it 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 had some it had some injuries uh, on its ribs, and uh, but the injuries are not from a from a predator. Maybe something fell on it or something like that. Who knows? Or maybe it fell. Uh, but it, so maybe the conclusion, and of course this can only be a, a hypothesis, is that um, the the Brumistega was injured and it was looking for a place to rest and recuperate. And so maybe it went into the same. It found a place to hide and whilst it was hiding then the, something happened and the two of them died in there and they became fossilized um so uh this is quite actually uh, I, I think this was quite interesting uh in any case um also uh, it is known that it is not uncommon because they are sort of from the fa same family um when you look um in sort of in, in the paleontological uh, tree so they are not uh, they're from the same family and so it is not uncommon for uh, for animals that are sort of related to sometimes share a habitat uh, without being aggressive to each other. So, uh, and this of course was the paper that was um, sort of came out of that study. Um, so I think um, having said that, um, I saw also from the previous presentations that um, then uh, they were, I, I thought that we, we would, I would then leave some time and sort of try to open up some possible discussion um, areas, if should there be any. Um, so there is, um, for teaching material, then in uh, for paleontological uh, material, one of the places one could go to, to sort of acquire some of the 3D materials you, is Morphosource. Um, this is a website where uh, in, in many people, after you've done your study, you sort of put a, a repository and uh, it is easy, quite easy to get 3D uh, sort of a surface, um, uh, surface files of, of a lot of fossils, uh, materials. And from these, you can actually then, if you could use a 3D printer uh, and for teaching purposes. So this is one sort of way of doing it. Um, also for, I think quite a lot of these uh, museums and uh, fossil re repositories, like at the Evolutionary Studies Institute where I'm from, um, we also have a casting lab where uh, a lot of people from around the world are constantly buying replicas of, of uh, a little food, replicas of certain, so you just put an order and, and then it is made for you and then, uh, and then couriered to your place. And people use these for, for, for lectures and, um, and teaching purposes uh, as well. 
So this is one of the uh, one one sort of uh, possibilities. And then there's um, uh, again uh, a website called uh, if you just Google uh, Digital Rocks Portal. Um, so not necessarily since this is also about tomography and uh, imaging. Uh, one, I, I think for today, because my topic was, was paleontology, I had to, to try and stick to, to paleontology mainly. But uh, with tomography, I think you, you might have seen from Gianluca and, um, and, and Andrea's presentation that um, tomography is a, a very broad field. Uh, it is applicable to paleontology, applicable to material sciences, apl applicable to in industry. So in industry, for example, you can you, you, you want to inspect parts that you're making. So if there are faults in them, you bring uh, to a tomography lab, you do the tomography, and then you actually find what is going wrong. So for example, you can find maybe a part that is made by any additive manufacturing, uh, but it develops cracks. You want to see if the process of making it is actually the one that is made that is bringing that is causing the defects in the material. Uh, so one could actually do in situ measurements where you 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 do the radiography or tomography as you are doing them as, as you are you um, sort of um, making the sample. Uh, they are also. There's also applications in geology. I've already done some, some, some geological samples here, the ESRF for a few users. Um, so on the digital rocks portal, you find quite a lot of data that is available uh, for where, which is free or free. So you could actually just uh, go and try to download some of the data for teaching purposes if you wanted to. And uh, then one could then do sort of a, a number of um, of techniques. Um, um, I, sorry, there's a bit of noise on my end. I hope you you don't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can yeah. still hear you though. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the Digital Rocks portal is a very useful um, um, resource, and uh, of course, I've I've generally talked about a, a bit of uh, software tools that people can use. Uh, I think uh, when we're teaching in high school, one would not probably need to go and buy the softwares like uh, Aviso and, um, and, and, and Volume Graphics. Uh, of course, if the resources are there, why not? <laughs> because um, it would probably cost quite, uh, quite a bit to, to get them. But um, when resources are limited, one could um, get ImageJ and you could actually look at slices and one could do quite a lot with uh, ImageJ. Um, this is quite, um, the, because it's open source also, um, it, and it is free of charge, um, you, you'll find that there is a lot one can do with, uh, with ImageJ. You can do segmentation, you can do measurements, you can, you can check for porosity, uh, check porosity in a volume, you can select a volume. It, you even have a 3D uh, sort of a volume analyzer. It is not as great as using Aviso, and image, eh? which is why they are super expensive. But um, but it is um, but it for for teaching purposes, this is a, a very useful resource. And um, just to add, I think so. So one could actually so you can see here. So this is something that I'm actually working on. It's a metal in it's, it's a it's a, uh, it's a it's a it's a sample that is made by. Um, metal injection molding. And you can actually see a clear defect here and you can see some porosity and there are various co conclusions that can be drawn from this sample um, from uh, the way it was sort of uh, made and, um, um, uh, and, and then sort of looking at what, uh, what it looks like after, 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 after processing the data. Uh, so in short, what I'm really saying is, um, if someone, if you are teaching sort of a physics class, you might want to do sort of look at more in, in, on the material side of things. And this is still sort of a, a viable option. The techniques are transferable. Uh, one, if, if you had, I, I, of course it depends on where you come from and the level of the students that you're teaching, but um, they, 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 there are also resources where you one could do some of the, some of the analysis, uh, or at least some of the sort of sort of basic analysis, in um, in in in, um, in 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 Jupyter notebooks, for example, if you have um, if you have got a computer science class, um, you could actually take some images and play around with them, do some um, 
some background subtraction, some some, some uh, flat field subtraction, and something like that, and and uh, flat field correction, and and play around with the images. You they are um, a bit of tools to do some reconstructions, but I don't really know whether in high school um, people go to this extent. Different regions, probably uh, different levels of students, and different sort of uh, syllabuses, and depending on what people are looking at. So. Uh, having said that, I, of course, would like to thank everyone involved in the uh, presentation. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Excellent thank presentation. Yeah. So thank questions. You. If you would raise your hand if you have a question for Kuda. We'll take a few minutes for that. Okay, uh, Itama has. Uh, okay, hold on for a second, Itama. So let's give preference to the teachers. So, so Kar Karari. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, my question is related to the techniques that you used. How much time required to capture data for having a true dimensional uh, data or troubleshoots part. How much time? Uh, <laughs> well, it can be as little as I mean. Okay, so so it depends. Just to get the three D data, um, image data, uh, as long as the specimen, of course, is readily available, um, it can take. It can be like an hour, thirty minutes, sometimes fifteen minutes. So, for example. When I showed uh, the extant um, uh, monkey, um, monkey bone, that you can do in something like 16 minutes in a, in a lab-based uh, CT scanner because there are no difficulties. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah. So getting the data is the easy part, but doing the analysis now and trying to draw the conclusion, that, that can- That's very difficult, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that can take time, yeah, because- yeah. Yeah, you, you now have to, first is the extraction of the data. Uh, if it's a fossil which is embedded in, 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 in a rock, for example, the, a lot of time is spent segmenting, just selecting the, what is fossil and what is not. It could easily take three months. <laughs> so, so, so this is, this, this is really, bo yeah, this is, this, is, yeah. this is really the painful bit. And because of this, there are a lot of people at the moment who are working on uh, AI and machine learning uh, methods to try and do automatic segmentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Itama. Right. Um, I have two questions. Um, one regarding um, ideas for uh, activities in, in, uh, in school and high school. Um, the example that you brought with a uh, bone structure and then try to um, come to conclusion the, what sort of loads were being put on. Is, is this something that is also, um, um, if, I, I, if available open or is it in process? I think, because I was thinking that this might be an option to develop some activity because it's visual and also if you have numbers and then yeah so uh, let me see um so i think the thing is we're talking about this this bit here right uh, your first example yeah this one this one this one yes so um, the, the so data. you had a slide with with a table with with, with some data. On uh, this the next, one. yeah, this one, yes. Yeah. So I think um, to to do something like this should be pretty straightforward. Well, it, it it's it's doable for for as an exercise because um, once the data is available, if you could find it, say on MorphoSource. And you, I think for teaching purposes, you don't particularly need to have the fossil. You could actually go and get um, a, 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 something else. For example, if you, if you can find a monkey bone at, at, at a medical center or, or a museum near you, and then 
you, 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 there is a city scanner close by. This would, as I was saying, this takes something like 15, 20 minutes. And it's no, but I, I mean, using, using already data acquired by you, not doing it yourself, just as an exercise for students in high school. Um, it's, it's good to let them work on data and, and, and you know, translate ah. numbers to conclusions. So I'm not looking at doing it, just something if, if there's like, Photograph city images ready and this kind of a table. So I'm asking if something. Yes, yes. This, so I think, so for example, in this particular case, if you just send us an email, we'll probably send you the data for <laughs> this kind of thing. So um, yeah, so maybe I, I will try to follow up with you if it's okay and, and see if there's something we can develop from there. Yes. One thing that I would just say is because uh, we would be able to give you the data probably next year once we have completed the study uh, that's one so it's on it's still ongoing in it's study. still ongoing yes because we have added a lot more specimens uh for the statistics we can't we can't definitely can't use seven specimens so mm -hmm. yeah so we will we, we'll wait patiently no problem uh, <laughs> my, my second question uh you mentioned uh what you call the uh the cradle of mankind Yes. So just as an opportunity, if, if I have an expert here. So what I also tell my student, if when it comes up evolution or something like that, that from what I understood is that there is DNA evidence that all of mankind we know today have origins in Africa. So is this true? So what is the consensus? Uh, knowledge of, of scientific knowledge today when it comes to the origins, geographic origins of, of mankind? Uh, yes, so um, indeed it is very true that um, um, there is DNA evidence uh, of this, but uh, in addition to this, um, in paleontology as well, I think um, at the moment, the you could say most of the um, significant fossil finds have only been in Africa, uh, which show so far the fossil find finds show um, show that the the Africa was the cradle of mankind. That people were in Africa before there was this migration, and then then they moved into um, into Europe over time. So yes, there is. And just to mention also about the DNA, um, there have been a few fossils here and there where, where there have been some uh, DNA that has been preserved. And so sometimes it is an issue when you are doing tomography because um, if, if there is a chance that there is some DNA preserved, then you don't want to also uh, damage that in case someone else wants to do a study on the DNA. Yeah, I think the oldest human fossil is from Ethiopia. Am I correct about that? You 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 had a map of human. Um, it's it's from Chad. old fossils. Some of it, the early fossils. Yeah, it's it's from Chad. It's from Chad. Uh, yes. Oh really? Yes, oh okay. Yeah, the uh, Sahel Anthropus uh, chadensis. It's seven million. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. I think at this point, I think, uh, thank you so much. I mean, that was really, I learned a lot about paleontology today and um, we really are appreciative. Um, so I'll turn it over, back over to Erskud um, to close us out. Stop sharing. Thank you, Kuda. This was really, really an interesting subject. And I, previously I did not have that much information. So for me, it was very helpful. Thank you for your participation. And thanks to everybody. And uh, if you don't have any more questions to Kuda, I think we came to the end of this today. We could finish and continue tomorrow. And I, as I said yesterday, I also record this session too. So I will send these to you, okay? Yeah. Goodbye. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. A lovely day and evening and night wherever you are.